I had a near-death experience in 1987, and it changed my life completely. I was in the height of my career as a freelance image consultant with CBS News in the news division. We were wrapping up on a party, a television series party, on November the 11th, 1987. I was a guest of a female celebrity, and we were celebrating my birthday as well as a wrap party. And that night I became very ill. I began to have stomach cramps, and I began to bleed. I had been diagnosed uh, with what they thought was a stomach ulcer several months ahead of time, and I let something very simple go by refusing to take the medications, and consequently, I began to lose weight. I had lesions on my face, on my, on my uh, throat, and my neck, and my torso, and while I was in the restroom, I kind of doubled over in pain and hit the sink. Uh, I excused myself, drove myself home, and when I got to my front door, I collapsed, and I was bleeding on my carpet, on my suit. Uh, apparently, I didn't know at the time that uh, my intestinal tract had burst inside, and they had diagnosed me as ulcerative colitis. And I called a friend once I got up, and they rushed me to the emergency room, and they refused to check me in because they thought I had AIDS. And back in the middle of the 80s, or the latter part of the 80s, there was so much negative media hype on the AIDS epidemic that many people who were dying of AIDS or coming into the hospitals were turned away, myself included. I was pushed in a corner, left to die. I don't tell you how long I was there, maybe an hour, before someone discovered me, a wonderful nurse who became my savior that night, and it was she who rushed me to the OR. She made sure that the doctors took care of me. Of course, by the time I got into the OR, uh, I had lost so much blood for the last six months that um, they couldn't keep the IVs in me. My veins kept bursting. And uh, as I began to, to fade in and out of consciousness, I began to see the first tunnel while I was on the operating table. And I could see this tunnel spinning, rotating. I call it the bullseye. I didn't know what was happening. I, I didn't know why I was seeing this, and it seemed so real. I watched the doctors in slow motion go to medical protocol. They turned me over on my side and tried to hook the IV up into part of my, uh, a lower part of my back, and that's when I went out. I remember as I was fading into, I guess, a black tunnel, it was though I was in a room full of light and color, and all of a sudden there was a snap, and it was just this black line, and then I looked around the room, and me, in spirit form, if you will, was looking down at Peter Anthony, me looking at me, but from above. And I could see the doctors and the nurses and the anesthesiologists going to medical protocol. And I remember looking at that and feeling what is going on, but at the same time, not questioning anything because everything was so surreal. And I also felt as though something was attached to my solar plexus and as though I was being vacuumed into this tunnel. I could see people that I recognized, relatives and friends and family, that had, were greeting me at this tunnel. And I remember seeing my third grade teacher, Mrs. Bellamy, but not the Mrs. Bellamy that I knew in school, but a younger version of Mrs. Bellamy, someone very happy and someone trim, someone pretty, as opposed to this woman that I remember in school as being frumpy probably. It seemed like something happened in her life that she just lost that zest for life. It was though she was just on a pause moment going through life. And that's what I remember seeing her, but here was this young woman full of life and energy, and, and she greeted me. And then I remember I was spinning in this rotating tunnel. I began to see mathematical equations, 222, 333, 444, 1111. I began to see all these quantum physics codes, geometry, you know, physics. And at that moment, as I'm spinning as a spirit into this tunnel, I'm digesting every mathematical code. I knew exactly what it meant. And me, being an artist, very right brain, was operating on a left brain consciousness, digesting and absorbing and knowing all these mathematical equations and what they meant. Once I got through the tunnel, I ended up in this tree. I don't even know where to begin to describe this tree, but I was sitting in this tree and I was greeted by, I call it an ascended master or, or an angel, if you will, or uh, an entity or a being that was advanced. You know, being agnostic at the time, I didn't believe that there were angels. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in Jesus. You live, you die, you work, you get a family, you buy a home, and that's it. 
there was no interpretation, there was no alertness to religion. I just denied it, if you will. But I just didn't believe in the God that I had been taught. And so there I'm sitting on this tree in a stratosphere before me with my life review. It began from the time I was born in a hospital until the time I died. And I watched everything in my life, moments that you forget about, moments that you driving around and, and you acknowledge someone across in the street or you see a child at, at a park. And every moment of my life had been recorded like a matrix. It was like everything was showing simultaneously of everything, every conversation, every person, every situation, every encounter, every moment that no one thought, you know, or when we, we go back to those moments, we, we think no one's watching. Everything recorded. And I remember in high school, my sister was sharing a locker next to me, and it was my birthday. And my sister and I were very close, and all my football buddies were around me. And she was saying, aren't you going to say how much you love me and how much you care for me? I'm your best friend. And I'm watching this moment embarrassed because she's doing all this in front of my friends. And I'm watching this as though not in a, in, a, in a perspective of judgment and sadness, but awareness, watching my sister say all these things. And I could hear my thoughts in my head, watching this moment in my life, saying, oh, just go away. My, my friends are watching. And I didn't say anything and I walked away. That was the night my sister was killed by a drunk driver. What I learned was those moments when we go through life that we don't share with people, how much we love them, how much we care for them. The moment for me as I looked down, there was no judgment. He's like, you know, this angel, if you will, see what you did. There wasn't any of that. What was there was in my heart, you could have done better, Peter. My sister and I were left in an orphanage and, uh, you know, when you have a a bond with the only family member that you remember when I lost her, it was tough. And these moments kept occurring where you would see your life that you look down, again, no judgment, but an observation with kindness and compassion and understanding for, for yourself of everything that we do that we think we're not being watched. It's our life. Those moments that we can shine as individuals, every moment of our life, are recorded. I didn't murder anyone. I didn't, uh, you know, rob a store. I wasn't vile to people. But what I did see, as I said, were these moments where I could have shined, where I could have helped someone that needed help. I remember driving. I was being interviewed for CBS, and it was this is my sixth and final interview, and I thought I had it in the bag, and you know, rather cocky. And I'm driving across this bridge, and I have my windows down, and music is playing loud, and I pull up some gum and take it off the wrapper and put it in my mouth, and I flick the wrapper and the paper off the bridge, and I watch this wrapper just going down this river, and this wrapper is met by trash. I'm seeing needles, I'm seeing cat litter, I'm seeing all kinds of debris, trash meeting trash. And I watched this wrapper go down this river into a lake, and the lake went off into another river, and it went down the river past these oil refineries and all the toxic waste that were coming out of this factory, this oil refinery, were meeting other waste. And what I saw were children swimming in the river and the lakes. I guess I was forwarded to a, a moment in my life where I could see these children that had died due to the toxic waste and the doctors having no idea what happened, yet the oil companies and the oil refineries, they did. I saw the pharmaceutical companies turning their, their faces in another direction. It made me realize that my one wrapper affects everyone. And so it made me, when I came back, more environmentally aware. To this day, I try to do things that basically you know, are more positive to the environment. And again, I, I say this because my life review was about everything and nothing. How each moment that we live on this life is a moment of, of value. And we kind of forget that. So I went to this place called Bordeaux. For those who are Catholic, you might know the, the term purgatory or limbo. And there was a cleansing. I called it the cleansing station. And I got a chance to look around, if you will, a, a much larger stratosphere. I was in this galaxy looking down at Mother Earth and 
looking at the stars and other planets, but it was though I had a zoom lens and I could zero into different parts of the world. I could see the massacre in the dolphin. And I could see governments all around the world. We given our power away to, to leaders who basically abuse that power. And we were so eager to give that power to people who were so eager to use it against us. And you're watching this and again, no judgment. You're not looking down and going, oh, what a horrible human being you are, what a horrible leader you are. But what you're seeing from your perspective is, wow, what can I do to contribute? I'm having this conversation with what I call God. But it wasn't the man in the beard and the white cloak and the staff. And it was an entity surrounded by gold fragments of life. You know, imagine a fire going out on the ambers, the gold ambers just are floating all around you. But multiply that by 10 times. This, this fragment of energy was going through me. It came from my solar, in the back, and went out through my solar plexus, and I could feel this kindness and compassion and love that, how do you describe it? I mean, if you have a dog, you know how much you love your dog. If you have a girlfriend, you know how much you love your girlfriend. Multiply that 10 times, 10 times 10. It's not suffice. That's how much love you feel. For me, this was a, a turning point in my life because I realized that we as a, as a people, we have a lot of anger. I could see, as I said, and I was just the massacre of the animal kingdom, but what we did to our Mother Earth and, and war, I mean, I saw so much war going on. We are a warring planet. And based on what? Someone's ego, someone's abuse of power. So as I looked at this planet that we call Earth, I was given a choice to go back. Do you want to go back? The voice said. And I could look at all this anger on our planet, the warring nations, but I also got a chance to see teachers and firemen and policemen and, and neighbors and strangers doing such kind deeds. I also got a chance to see my life ahead. I saw myself speaking to scores of people at lectures. I saw myself writing books. Uh, I saw myself traveling around the world talking about my near-earth experience. I also saw my two-year recovery and I knew the challenges ahead. The psychiatrist and I also saw my attempted suicide. All these things I saw ahead and the voice, do you want to go back? And I said yes. And I remember all around me were these fragments of energy and color and, and I remember being in this sphere of light, if you will, going back and I remember the moment I hit my physical body. I remember that I woke up, apparently I was unconscious for three and a half weeks and when I woke up, there were Christmas decorations in the hospital. When I went into the hospital on November the 11th, there was nothing. So it was this kind of reality check of, oh my God, this time had lapsed, what happened? But something occurred on the other side and so many people always say, oh, it's just a dream, or you hallucinated, or so many of these things that they say are not real. You and your whole heart know what you saw on the other side. You know what you felt on the other side. And while I was going down the hallway in the hospital and watching people go in and out of this hospital, certainly on a very difficult night, not only for myself, but for other patients who were coming in, there was a friend of mine who showed up, and I remember passing her, this me, Peter, the spirit form, passing her, and as she as I passed her, she said, Peter Anthony, it's not your time to go. And I remember that moment. And so when she came into the room, I shared that with her. And she looked at me as though, how did you know that? I also came back with this knowledge of my disease and that the medications that they were giving me were causing harmful effects to my physical body. So I would have these conversations with the doctor about the antibiotics and the the cortisones and the steroids they were putting in my body in, and they wouldn't listen to me. They kept feeding my body with all these harsh chemicals. I lost my vision, I couldn't walk. The staph infection appeared out of nowhere and stayed on my face and just basically crawled from cheek up to, to ear. They couldn't cure it. I had these adverse reactions, inexplicable reactions to all the medications that were given me. And the doctors couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain why I had lost my vision. They couldn't explain why I couldn't walk. I knew. And so what I did, I told my friend, the woman I, that came to stay with me and, and throughout this horrible hospital experience, and I asked for certain vitamins. I asked for acidophilus. I asked for pure garlic. 
I asked for certain herbs and she would go off to the vitamin stores and find these herbs and vitamins and bring them back to me and, and I began to take these herbs because I knew I had to. And I began to wean myself off the, the medications that the doctors were giving me. And it was that that helped save my life. So for me, the challenges medically were tough, but the most difficult part were the people who didn't listen to me, who didn't believe me. I came back, as I said, you know, not stuttering, but I came back talking about what happened to me on the other side. I just couldn't share my story enough with people and they look at you like you're a nutcase. And you know, I could hear the nurses' thoughts in their head, oh my God, this guy is a whack job. You know, and they would look at my frail body and everyone had given up hope on me. <laughs> Not me. I knew what I had to do. I knew I had to write books. I knew I had to travel. I knew I had to, to do lectures and talk about my near-death experience, but people just didn't care. I remember uh, one day the doctor came in and said to me, Mr. Anthony, unfortunately I have some bad news for you. We're going to have to do another surgery. I knew that if I went in for another surgery, that was it. And so I said, I, I, I refused the surgery. They also wanted to do um, radiation treatment. If that didn't work, they would do chemo. And I knew if I had chemo or did radiation treatment, I was a goner. So I refused. Uh, and they told me that if I didn't do this, I had less than three months to live. I remember <laughs> months later when I was being checked out. It's not that I walked, but friends helped me. And I hobbled to that elevator, down that hallway, down to the elevator. And I turned around to that doctor and said, I'm walking. And that was the moment that I knew that life began for me, walking down that hospital corridor, because I was determined that no one else's opinion was going to matter more than my own. I went back to see that doctor, and he called me to his miracle patient, stunned by my recovery, stunned by you know, what I was doing in terms of my own recovery. I guess the saddest part of, of recovery are the people who, who didn't believe, the friends that disappeared, what little bit of family I did have left, still to this day doesn't talk to me. There's a lot of suicide with near-death experiencers. They can't deal with the information that we've been given. I have a, a dear friend of mine who had a near-death experience and her husband is the deacon of a Baptist church. She's talked about her near-death experience. She's forbidden to talk about it. Her husband basically is not kind to her and she's brilliant. And she sits in this world of religion, if you will, and they don't believe her. So it's tough, it's tough for many of us. I have many people who have passed and have come back uh, who are experiencers who have a really tough time dealing with what we call the real world because you come back hypersensitive and you look at life differently. You know, I, I lost my vision. Every morning I get up, I take a gratitude walk and I look around all this beauty and I know I've been given a second chance. So I don't take what I see for granted. Add the fact that I was in a wheelchair for quite some time. I couldn't walk. When I walk to this day, I'm grateful. We take for granted that we're given a day. Your, your day could end this afternoon at two o'clock. So I don't take any of that for granted. I live my life as though today is my last day. And I mean that. My psychic abilities, uh, began to happen while I was recovering in the hospital. I began to see ghosts uh, that would walk into the rooms. I would see uh, patients that had passed and I'm walking down the hallway and I'd see my world, meaning the real world, and you'd have the paranormal world of doctors and nurses and who had passed and patients who had died and there was world within world. So I began to communicate with these ghosts. So for me, spirits come, they talk to me. People don't understand when they talk to you, they talk to you as though they're communicating. You hear the sound here. I lost my sister on my birthday on November the 11th. In fact, every person I've loved, I've lost on November the 11th. I died on November the 11th. I lost my grandfather on November the 11th. So when my sister comes to me, she's usually at the foot of the bed and she's encased in blue light. And very quietly and very softly, she speaks to me. You feel it here in your heart, in your soul, in your chest. You communicate on a very intuitive level. How do you explain that? You share that and people look at you as though you're a nutcase. But for those of us who've had that experience, you never forget it. It's real to you. And you're wide awake when it's happening. 
And so I have learned to operate within both worlds. And for me, when I listen to those spirits who come to me, and they come to me all the time, I had one appear last night who shut off the TV. I wasn't anywhere near the remote. I have lights that flicker on and off. I mean, I always know when something shows up in my world. You know, the room smells of, you know, of roses or gardenias or the temperature drops. You just know when a spirit is, is, is approaching or is, or is there. And you learn to work with that. The other world, the afterlife, became a part of my new reality. And what I did, I read. I was so enamored by numbers and what I saw on the other side. I had my friend Nora bring me numerology books and I would just read the basic numbers of one through nine of numerology. I had to bring astrology books and I began to absorb all this information. It made sense to me. I was in isolation. I didn't go out. I basically went to work, shared my story with no one and read and studied. I saw clients on the side for free trying to understand what this was I was experiencing. And I remember that phone call that came in. It was a homicide detective and said, Mr. Anthony, this is homicide so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, detective so-and-so, and we're working on a case. And uh, he said it revolves around uh, special effects makeup, which I had been studying, and also numerology. And uh, it was a case they couldn't solve, and it was codes that they found at this, uh, at this uh, victim's home. I didn't know what I was doing. I never worked on a, a homicide case before, but I showed up. And this is when the spirits began to kind of appear to me. What turned out to be the victim in my world of understanding, he was actually the serial killer. And uh, I was able to help these detectives solve a murder case that was going in the wrong direction. And this led me to going on a television series called Sightings. And I became the country's youngest paranormal investigator traveling around the United States of America, you're working on unsolved murder cases and going to haunted caves and cemeteries and uh, houses that were haunted, you know, caves that were haunted. <laughs> and I left CBS as an image consultant, freelance image consultant, and I did a pilot. It aired on a Friday night. And one night, my entire life was changed, going into what many people call witchy woo-woo. And here I was as a paranormal investigator traveling around and using these gifts that I had apparently brought back with me from the other side. I, I, to this day, I don't know how I know what I know. When I walk into a, a, to a, a, a crime scene, I see images. I know when I'm working on a case, and that's legit, if the night before the ghosts show up, and they usually show up between 3 and 3.15 in the morning, and that's how I know I'm working on a, on a legit case. And when I show up, I went to a Catholic church downtown Los Angeles, uh, had an entire production crew there. Um, we were working with a celebrity host, and they were in this church laughing about the ghost and the, the murder. They, none of them believed what was going on there. And there I am, I'm seeing a nun with her hands crossed over like this, shaking her head. There was a priest, there was a child who had died in this particular church, and they're sitting here. So there is no respect for the other, the other side at times, and my job as a I don't want to use the, the, the word or term ghost whisper, but that's pretty much what I am. I listen to the whispers of these, of these ghosts, of these entities, of these spirits, if you will. And that's how they talk. They whisper to us. Imagine you're filming me and all of a sudden you have a ghost behind me and this ghost is trying to communicate with you. Well, first of all, logic says you're stunned by what you're seeing and you deny it. So right off the bat, your consciousness goes to the left brain and tells you this is not happening. The right brain is telling you, yes, it is happening. You're in battle, what we call the tug of war of, of the left and the right brain. So by the time you digest the information, the spirit is left. What I've learned to do is when that moment occurs, I listen to the ghost. I don't <gasps> freak out and go, what are you doing here? What do you want to say? You listen. What I've learned and what I teach especially those who come to me for off my lectures, be still. Just quiet yourself and the message will come. The message always comes through a song, through a conversation. What so many of us do is we deny and we can't accept that truth. And it is the truth. I mean, you know, you can't accept that this image that is before you is an actual image. So we basically lie and deny to ourselves. And so what happens in our paranormal world where things go bump in the night, these spirits are communicating with us. 
Every one of us has intuitive abilities. We just don't use them because it goes back to how we were taught. We are taught basically that this world that we're living in now is in a real world. And so therefore, if it's happening to us, we go back to our memory of that's not real. You know, perhaps it was your father, perhaps it was a teacher, it was a priest, things like that don't exist. You go back to that learning, it just can't be real. And so what happens, these spirits, these, these images, these unusual events that take place will continue to take place in your life until it gets your attention. Why did it happen? When's it going to happen again? How long will it take before it happens? We, we go back to that logical way of, of trying to put something abnormal into a normal equation, and so therefore it doesn't make sense, so we deny it and move on, and it happens again. And it keeps happening. You know, I've, I can't tell you how many, signs I've, I've how many times I've seen a billboard that I'm going through a conflict in my life. An example, moving to Palm Springs. I had a job offer in Los Angeles. I had two in San Francisco. I had a job offer in Denver. And I was asking universe, God, if you will, spirit, to show me, to, to, to give me an answer. And I ran a red light and almost hit a moving truck. And on that truck, it says, move to Palm Springs. I moved it with no job. How do you explain that? And I remember the first day I sat down, I said, okay, I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna talk about my near-death experience and I'm gonna travel. And the phone wasn't ringing, but I knew it was supposed to happen. So I just had to hand it over. You learn to listen to the whis whisper. Spielberg talks about it all the time. Alfred Hitchcock spoke about it. You just learn to trust your intuition because your intuition is never wrong. I no longer explain to, to any of my friends, well, back then I no longer explained to people. I now have friends who support me and trust me and know that my intuition is spot on. And so when I get a premonition, when I get an idea or a hunch, they listen to me because they've seen it happen in my life too many times. So I've learned to operate with intuition as my guiding principle. And for me, for my world, it works. One of the greatest lessons I learned was the law of attraction. Thoughts do become things. Write your thoughts down. Every day I have a thought or a manifestation near my computer or on my daily calendar. And I write it down and every day I visualize it and I see that. You put it into your consciousness and you begin to allow the universe to bring the, the, the seeds to you. Till your soil, do your work, get on with your day, but allow the universe to bring to you the gift. And this is what I do. Provide the people, the place, and the situations. And my job is to show up in faith, not in fear. Most of us show up in fear. And so consequently, when that, when that affirmation, when that manifestation list is beginning to appear, something happens in our life, and it's like it kind of dissuades that consciousness, if you will, or that affirmation, and you start back all over again. What I began to learn to do is attract what I feel is my piece of the pie. And I don't listen to the naysayers. You know, when I went on to the series sightings, my agent and the producers, CBS, said, don't do that. A uh, friend said, don't do that. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, when I began to write this book, Keymaster, you can't write. No one's going to listen to your book about your near-death experience. I'm traveling around the world talking about my near-death experience. You go into what you know in your heart, and your heart doesn't lie to you. Your hunch does not lie to you. What you know that you're capable of doing, if you have given, uh, been given a God-given talent, you know what your job is. Walk in faith and not in fear. And so when those outside voices, what I call the opinions of other people, step in, I tune them out. You'll learn to operate on a much higher level. Start with the little things. You know, with me, I, I always see my bank account at a certain amount. And it's funny how I'm self-employed. Checks always seem to come in the mail. Every day I get a check, I bless it. When you hand something over to the universe, you know, think about it. Look at all the planets and the sun and the trees and nature all in perfect alignment. It's us who are not in perfect alignment. Get in alignment with yourself, your higher self, if you will. That's how it works for me. And I trust when I put something out to the universe, I call it my PO, my purchase order to the universe. You know, if I put a certain thing out to the universe, if I, ask, if I go to a restaurant and ask for chicken fried steak and gravy and, and biscuits, you know, I'm assuming that it's going to happen. I'm not going to get meatloaf and, and uh, mashed potatoes. So that's how I approach life. I put exactly out what I want to see from the universe. 
and it just seems to happen. You have to believe that it's going to happen. You have to believe, and when you believe, it manifests into your life. When you doubt, it seems to come up, and then something gets in the way and changes that. That, that, that one core ingredient I call faith is what gets me going. I'm here living proof. I'm not supposed to be here. They gave me three months to live. I would never walk again. We didn't know what was going to happen to my vision. Here I'm seeing. You know what? If you learn to operate in gratitude and faith and compassion and hand your life over to the universe and just be in perfect alignment and start listening to those billboards or those signs or that conversation or that movie that happens to speak to you, stay there for a moment and allow something to happen in your life. Because that's where entertainers, if you want to say millionaires, celebrities, certain people, athletes, you know, they believe in the power of mind. The mind is brilliant. Use it. And that's what I learned on the other side, to use my mind. I never wrote a book before. I wrote my book. I didn't even know how to type. I wrote my book on sticky notes and handed all my sticky notes over to a person who typed. Then I said, okay, now I need an editor. So I put that out. Okay, I need an editor. And I met with the woman from Paramount, and she said, this is a really good, great concept, but you need a good editor. I said, well, I don't know an editor. She said, well, I know somebody. And so she made a phone call. The editor turned me down because I was a first-time writer, but I handed the manuscript over, and it was six months before it was read. It was her husband who was atheist who had read the manuscript who said, you've got to help this man edit his book. And we've been editors since 2003. I mean, she's been my editor since 2003. I have seen in my life things that have occurred that I thought were impossible that have occurred. The universe's job is to provide the people, the place, and the situation. And our job is to trust. If there's one thing you can do on this planet, what do you want to do? What's the end result? What is the end goal? That's how I began to see my life occur. And the other world that we try is, well, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Should I do it? Maybe not. Could I have done this? I don't know. I don't live in that world of doubt anymore. I believe I'm here for a purpose. And once you believe in your purpose, there's nothing that's going to stop you. I've learned to change my vocabulary in my head. I can do this. I used to stutter. When I saw myself on the other side, speaking to people, I thought, how am I going to do that? I remember the first time I did a television interview, I was so nervous I stuttered, and they yanked me off set. I was humiliated. But I said to myself, never again will I walk in the shadow of someone else who's going to make fun of me. I refuse to have that happen ever again. It happened to me on my first radio interview. The, the, the DJ called me up and said, you're horrible. You need to learn how to talk. That doesn't go away. But I thought, this is the greatest lesson that ever happened to me because never again will that happen to me again. I will know my subject. I will know how to interview. I'll know how to know my bullets, what I want to talk about. I cared too much about what other people thought of me. I don't care anymore. What matters is what I think. Thoughts become things. They really do. But again, I'm going to say this again. Provide the people, the places, and the situation. You know, when you go in, if you trust God, universe, whatever you want to call it, that other world out there, provide the people. The people always show up. The editor showed up. Provide the, the, the places. L.A. showed up. Palm Springs showed up. And the situations. I can't tell you how many numerous situations have showed up in my life. Like here I am today. A situation presented itself. Believe in yourself. We have obstacles. We have challenges. We have all those things. We have money, woes, and issues, and fears. But guess what else? Good people show up. I was broke one time. I had was homeless, had a bathrobe, a slipper, and a cat, and a vase. And two people, Mario and Cecilia, showed up in my life and helped me. I had a, a landlord named Chuck who gave me three months free of rent until I got on my feet. But I'll never forget that night. I walked away in a bathrobe, a slipper, a cat, and a vase with nowhere to go and no insurance. Ground zero. There are things that happen in life that get you going. You know, if I can survive death, not once but twice, and here I am, I can still see, I can still walk. If there's a breath in me, I'll do something good. People ask me, all. this is a question I get asked all the time, you know, are we in the end days? The Bible says, the only good prophecy is the one that doesn't happen. And I think why near-death experiences are coming back, many of us are coming back with the same message. Love, 
kindness and compassion because our society has been taken to the lowest level possible and people, humanity, want answers. And if you look at our leaders, our politicians today, you look at our, our, our world order, everything's falling apart. Why? Because it needs to fall together. And so our job is to said, what I'm doing here is to share a message of truth. And if those days are going to happen, guess what? I'm going to be the first person on that line helping people. Our job is to show up and be good people. What I learned on the other side, there is no gay, there is no black, there is no Muslim, there is no Christian, there is no wealthy, there is no poor, there is spirit. All those categories that we've been taught for century after century, that's not what you see on the other side. What you see on the other side is spirit. What you feel is the essence of love. That's it. That's as simple as I can explain it. And what I learned when I came back, those people and those leaders and those, uh, those who abuse power are the ones who divide us by putting us in these categories. And that's so foreign to my consciousness to this day. Because again, that is not what you see on the other side. It's a very simple formula. Love, kindness, and unity. We're here to help. We're not here to destroy, but we do it. We're not here to be angry, but we're always angry. And we have become so <laughs> immune, if you will, or desensitized that it's me, myself, and I world. My job, my money, my relationship, my life, my career. And we've kind of lost the, the togetherness. You know what? If you really have to look at it, it's not the world that's screwed up. It's the leaders that are screwed up. Basically, when, you, when I've traveled around the world, people are really good people. They really are. It's those people in power who screw everything up because they get greedy. And they're not really living the values that they say they're living. They're kind of hypocritical. So we know that now. And they're not going to help us. So who's going to help us? You and I. And we start with self first. How can I contribute to the shift of kindness to humanity? Start there. How may I be of service? Every day, how may I be of service to the earth? That's my mantra. That's it. I don't ask for the money. I don't ask for the job. I don't ask for the, you know, any of that stuff. I just, how may I be of service? That's cosmic maturity. That's what we're looking for. And if we show up every day in faith and we show up with a blueprint, you think about it, if you're building a house, you just start to put the windows up and then put the chimney up, put the foundation up later. There is a system that works. Find your system that works for you and build it.